My name is Douglas Johnston. I served in the U.S. Navy during World War II from 1943 when I just got out of high school until uh, August of uh, 1946. War didn't hit home to me until uh, till, uh, Japan, until Pearl Harbor attack. I enlisted because uh, <coughs> my father uh, was a band director at uh, Larnard High School here in Kansas, and uh, uh, he had a very good friend on the draft board. And uh, this friend told my father that uh, when I graduated from high school in, in uh, spring of 43, uh, he told me that summer that I was gonna be probably in the draft in September. So in July, I went to Kansas City and enlisted in the Navy because I didn't want the Army. <laughs> to me, Army was digging a foxhole and fighting out of a, a foxhole, and I thought I'd much rather be on board a ship uh, on, in the sea, taking my chances there rather than uh, in a foxhole. In boot camp, uh, I passed the swimming test right off because uh, I was able to swim well enough that I could uh, swim by holding my arms up and and just kicking with my feet for five minutes and swim around the pool and uh, up in boot camp uh, several times that was required so I didn't have any trouble passing the swimming test. The only regret that I had because uh, my father was a band director and I knew how to play three instruments at the time and at the interview uh, in boot camp with the counselor, why, when he found out that uh, I could play several instruments and had uh, dance band experience, as well as a military type band playing, why, he said, well, I think we could send you to the Navy School of Music in Washington, D.C. He said, but there's just one hitch to it. He said, uh, if, if we did that, you'd have to sign up for six years instead of the duration of the war. Six years sounded like a long time to me, so I chose not to do that. I sometimes wonder how that would have changed my life if I had gone to the Navy School of Music, but as it was, I wouldn't have met the wife, my, the girl that I married, and so on and so forth, so it all worked out well in the long run. My only travel experience was to Colorado. My parents liked to camp, and we had the old-fashioned umbrella tent, and uh, we used to go up to Rocky Mountain National Park every summer and uh, camp out and hike and fish, and, and uh, I did that all four years of high school. So when I got married, of course, I took my wife to Estes Park, Colorado, Rocky Mountain National Park, uh, for our honeymoon. <laughs> she liked that because she'd never, uh, the farthest she'd been, she, she was from St. John, Kansas, and the farthest she'd ever been away from home was uh, eastern uh, Colorado to visit relatives. <laughs> My dad was a band teacher, so I lived in about six different towns. I was born in Emporia, Kansas, uh, moved to Oakley, Kansas, uh, then to uh, Kinsley, Kansas, then to Wichita, then to Peabody, then to Larnard, uh, and then that took me up to the time I was in the Navy. My boot camp was up in the wilds of uh, Farragut, Idaho. Uh, the, uh, there were lakes up there for uh, boat training, and uh, it was, closest town was Spokane, Washington, 45 miles away. We reached boot camp by train. Boot camp was eight weeks of training. We lived in a barracks with about 200 men in our company. It was very cold in the morning, and this was September, September and October. We had drill on a large uh, field uh, nearby, and uh, uh, we had one week of work week besides training. We had, uh, my job was to clean out the soot out of flue pipes from the furnace, uh, furnaces in all the barracks <laughs> for one week. But then we also uh, got KP to the duty of peeling spuds and, 
and serving chow and went home for 30 days leave and, and then back to boot camp uh, complex again to get assigned and that was when I was assigned then to uh, go to radio school at the University of Colorado, uh, no, Chicago, University of Chicago for radio training. And uh, because I could type so well and evidently caught on to Morse code easily that uh, only about uh, one-tenth of the class got promoted uh, to the next rank and I was lucky enough to get promoted from second class seaman to first class seaman. When I was in Chicago, uh, I went down to the loop, they called it, uh, often. Uh, uh, well, one reason why I could go so often was uh, uh, shortly after I arrived in radio school, the captain uh, or the commanding officer of the radio school decided that he would like to have a band for uh, inspection on Saturday morning. So the call went out for uh, anybody that could play an instrument to come and try out. And so I had my parents ship my clarinet to me. And uh, for the interview, uh, they said, uh, what music would you like to play? And I said, well, I still remember uh, John Philip Sousa's Washington Post March by memory. Uh, uh, I would play that for him. So I played this John Philip Sousa's uh, Washington Post March by memory. And they said, you got first chair. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, by playing in the band, uh, we got an extra limit liberty that the others did not get. So we got a Wednesday, uh, middle of the week liberty. And so I always went to the loop sometimes with a friend, sometimes by myself, took in uh, most of the big movie houses in Chicago had a stage production in between the showing of the feature film. And so I got to hear uh, Gene Krupa, Tommy Dorsey, Jimmy Dorsey, uh, all, all the big name bands on these stage shows that, uh, at the theaters. So that was what I spent a good deal of my time, plus went to the USO, and uh, they uh, oftentimes had big name bands uh, there too, performing. Benny Goodman, and, uh, um, and when, like I said, uh, Tommy, I got, got to hear Tommy Dorsey, and that was when Frank Sinatra was singing with him and the girls would all swoon in the aisle. <laughs> Went to uh, uh, the Opera House to a few performances, and of course I'd always heard of vaudeville, so went a couple times to see the old-fashioned, old-style vaudeville. Well, from there I was sent to Miami, Florida, and joined a crew for a ship that we had not picked up yet. And uh, we went into training uh, on small craft, subchaser type uh, patrol craft out of Miami. And then when our ship was completed up at the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, up in New York, why well, then our crew went up to uh, New York and picked up the ship and then had to put it through its sea trials and all. And uh, uh, this is just the way the government or the service works sometimes. Brand new ship, and then it was called a PC, patrol craft. We took this brand new ship down the coast to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, put it in dry dock in a shipyard there, and they stripped her down and, and rebuilt it uh, uh, with a lot of armor plate and extra guns and all and made a, what they called a patrol motor gunboat out of it. It was powered by two large diesel engines. Well, um, the, sh the kind of guns that we were going to have on our ship were 50 caliber machine guns, 20 millimeter uh, automatic fire guns, and a three inch uh, gun. And uh, uh, I did most of my work on the 20 millimeter, uh, and that's what I was uh, using 
at uh, the time that I shot down a Japanese kamikaze plane that was about to hit us. <laughs> the magazine held 80 rounds and had a, a fellow standing next to me. I was strapped into a harness and I had a fellow standing next to me ready to take out a magazine and clip a new one in. We had an electronic gun sight, <clears throat> but we didn't have much luck with it. And so uh, not far into the war, why we switched to uh, tracer control. Every third shell uh, was a tracer that would flare. and. Uh, and so uh, when we were shooting, uh, well, we just watched the tracers and fired by watching the tracers. Short bursts, otherwise the barrel would get so hot that it would melt. <laughs> the handler that handled the magazine, uh, we had a, a chute with water, filled with water. And when the barrel got, got hot, it just a twist of the barrel would release it, put it in the water to cool, and slap another barrel in. Well, the PT boats were uh, just small wooden craft. Yeah, they were made of wood. PT boats were made of wood. And they had a Chrysler engine in them and a crew of maybe seven. Well, our, our gunboat had a crew of 60 men and five officers, so it was considerably larger. Went overseas, went to Hawaii first, and there we picked up a... Uh, a group of uh, uh, small uh, uh, LSMs and LCIs, uh, flat bottom boats, and had to take them to Guam. And uh, uh, they were so slow moving that we took up the rear position, only used one engine out of our two, and still zigzag back and forth, otherwise we'd go too fast for them. <laughs> I think top speed was about uh, 23 knots. We were on what was called, uh, off Okinawa, a lot of ships were being hit by kamikaze planes. With still no tangible way to repel the aerial kamikazes, the commander-in-chief for the Pacific Theater, Admiral Nimitz, conferred with other high-ranking officials and even put out a call to everyone in the fleet for ideas on how to reduce the menace. Someone, although history does not know exactly who, came up with the picket defense. It involves sending smaller craft, destroyers, and minesweepers ahead of the fleet in the hopes of picking up the kamikazes on radar before they hit the main fleet and the Navy's precious aircraft carriers. It was a dangerous assignment and some of the men called the pickets tethered goats after the age-old shepherd's trick of sending the weakest of the flock to be attacked by wolves to save the rest. Indeed, the desperate kamikazes, wanting to do anything to avoid returning home to face the shame of failure and the prospect of preparing once again to die, descended on these smaller craft with a vengeance. It seemed by this point that a kamikaze would go after any kind of Allied vessel, from battleship to troop transports. Although the picket defense worked, the casualties were high, as were the numbers of sinkings. To try to intercept them before they got to the island, why stationed in all points around the island, we had what was called radar picket duty. And in our group, there were five ships two destroyers, our gunboat, and two flat-bottomed LCI uh, boats. And uh, we, we were just to circle an area and watch for planes either coming into the island or leaving the island. And the day that I shot a, a kamikaze down, uh, five planes came over after they had bombed on Okinawa. And uh, the two bombers tried to gain for height, and the three fighters that were with them uh, swooped down then and started to attack our group. And uh, uh, all of us were firing, and they came around 
the destroyers shot two of the planes down rather quickly. The third plane came in low, low over the water from out of the sun so that we would be looking into the sun. And uh, one of the LCIs crossed our stern uh, real close by, and he, as he swooped over, he dropped a bomb, which uh, did not look like a bomb. It just looked like a cylinder because it just wobbled as it fell. But it landed on the fantail of the LCI right where the 40 millimeter gun tub was and exploded all that ammunition, and it just literally blew the whole rear end uh, uh, off that ship and killed many people. Uh, the two fellows that were in the metal gun control tub for the uh, for firing the 40 millimeter gun tub, uh, all of their body that was above the edge of the gun tub was just absolutely blown away. And uh, then the ship, after after the plane crossed their path and dropped the bomb, he came straight for us. And our captain made the mistake of ordering a starboard turn instead of a port turn. And if he'd ordered a port turn, it would have put us broadside to the plane, and making it most of all, all maximum guns on bearing on him. But as it was, when he turned, the wheelhouse then blocked the three inch gun and the forward 20 millimeter gun and they could no longer fire. And uh, so that left two 20 millimeters of midship and a, and a 50 caliber machine gun. Uh, the 20 millimeter uh, gun to my left uh, was in the process of changing either changing barrel or changing uh, ammunition when when one of my shots luckily hit him and he had gotten so close to us that we just had to cover our ourselves with our arms because of all the shrapnel and debris that was falling and um, uh, then out, that was the last plane and so the attack was over and we then went alongside uh, the uh, ship that got hit uh, by the bomb and we transported 50 uh, of their crew to a hospital ship. Well, we were there five days before the invasion. The invasion of Okinawa was April Fool's Day. It would have been in March, the last, last five days of March. We were in support of uh, mine sweeper uh, ships and uh, they would go in with their paravanes and cables and sweep up the mines and then we would come along behind them and shoot them, shoot the mines after they'd floated to the top and destroyed the mines. After we left Okinawa, uh, I had an appendicitis attack and, and had to be transferred to another ship uh, and have my appendix removed. and. Uh, that was kind of interesting because uh, uh, the captain of this ship uh, had the ship turn into the wind to minimize wave action and had all work parties stop on board ship so there's no hammering or, or, or motors running or anything and while they operated on me and, uh, and so then uh, af after uh, I had it by uh, uh, I can't say the term now. Uh, very small incision, and uh, and so I wasn't laid up for very long. And uh, in the meantime, for while I was recuperating, my ship went to the Philippines, and they didn't think there's any way they could get me back to it. So they said, well. We'll just keep you on board this this ship and put you in a radio shack in radio duties, and then somehow a call went out that uh, this captain was organizing a staff to go to the inland sea of Japan to rid the inland sea 
of mines so that our invasion forces could go in and land in the Inland Sea of Japan and not have to worry about mines. So this captain needed a radioman on his staff. So here was an available man, so I got put on the I and another lieutenant got assigned to his staff. Uh, he wasn't there, so we followed him to Formosa. He wasn't there. He'd gone to Shanghai, so then we went to Shanghai to catch up with him. We got to Shanghai. He had already left for Japan, and so we finally got caught, caught up with him in Japan then. And, and uh, one interesting thing I might tell you about uh, this mine demolition work in the Inland Sea of Japan, we took uh, a cargo type vessel and equipped controls to control the engine uh, from up on the bridge so that nobody would need to be below decks. And uh, the mines sweepers would go in and make their sweeps uh, to uh, get rid of the mines, but there there were also magnetic or pressure type uh, mines below the surface that the minesweepers couldn't, couldn't reach those. And so after they were through making their runs, we would take this ship with everybody on board up above deck, not, not below deck, and we'd just go back and forth, back and forth across the area to make sure there were no pressure mines. Well, this one day I was sitting in the radio shack, and back in those days, uh, a Remington or a Royal uh, typewriter probably weighed 70 or pounds or something like that. And uh, we went over a pressure mine close enough that it exploded it. It uh, broke all kinds of fuel lines and water lines, of the, and uh, it broke 105 radio tubes in our radio shack. And when that explosion went off, I went over backwards in my chair, and I saw that 70-pound typewriter just go through the air over my head. <laughs> uh, this was, um, I say, the war ended in August of 45. This would have been uh, September, October, November, long in there. We were there five days, so I think I had three liberties in, uh, in Shanghai. Very congested, very dirty. Uh, uh, the harbor was just full of uh, uh, Navy ships, but it was also just full of uh, Chinese junks and small craft that, uh, and they would be uh, tied up side by side, and and uh, the people would walk back and forth across each other's boats to and do things. And uh, 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 we went to the mostly to the international uh, district of uh, Shanghai uh, where they had nice restaurants and uh, but uh, uh, the streets were very dirty the uh, uh, shopkeepers would bring their children out to the curb and let them urinate and, and go to the bathroom right on the street and uh, uh, we so amused at the international restaurant that we went to. Uh, just the head waiter was the only one that could speak any words of English, and he wasn't too fluent. And uh, but uh, with his help, we decided there were five of us. Uh, we decided we'd all like to try the roast duck, and so we all ordered roast duck. And he kept shaking his head, no. He said, yes, that's what we want, roast duck. No. <laughs> and he finally got it across to us that one roast duck was enough for all five of us. And uh, when it came, it came under silver dome and lifted the dome off, and there were the feet, the head, the eyes. Uh, all of the duck was there. <laughs> very interesting, but it was very tasty. And... Uh, and we had bean sprouts and, I don't know, about a 13-course dinner. And the cups of tea were so small, the little waitress got so tickled because I think I drank either 19 or 20 uh, cups of tea. 
because they were so small. But it was an interesting experience. Oh, uh, when we got to Formosa, uh, small boats came out to the ship trying to sell sake uh, liquor uh, and trinkets and stuff like that. And uh, they kept pretty close watch trying to keep the sailors from obtaining any of the sake. But we were just there in that port overnight and left. But in Shanghai, we were fortunate enough to be there five days before we went to Japan, so we got to have some liberty in, in Shanghai. At the port of Kobe, Japan, on the Inland Sea, uh, the, we uh, got uh, a couple of liberties there. One half of the ship would get liberty one day, and the other half of the ship would get it the next day. and. Uh, uh, I was with a friend that uh, was far more gutsy than I was. We got off into areas that we weren't supposed to be and talked to Japanese girls that uh, uh, could have led us astray. and uh, We could have been in real trouble, but fortunately we weren't. But the interesting, for me, the most interesting thing at, uh, at Kobe was uh, uh, we got invited uh, to the uh, uh, country club uh, place where all the foreign ministers from the different countries attended. And uh, they were gonna have wives and daughters and, and people there to let the sailors dance with. But this friend of mine was an excellent guitarist and I had my clarinet. And so we furnished the music for all, for all the dancing, so. On, on our liberty why we played for the dancing and that was real experience. And when we were in Shanghai, I went to a nightclub and uh, I and my friend uh, talked two of the members of the dance band there into letting us play a little bit using their instruments. So that was a fun thing to do. I didn't know anything about the atomic bomb until they announced it, that it had been dropped on Japan, and they told what magnitude it was and how many hundreds of thousands of people it killed and, and all of which, and it just blew our mind, really, because we didn't uh, know anything about atomic bombs. Uh, one interesting th thing I might add was uh, when I was in radio school at the University of Chicago, we had to march. They'd line us up outside the dorm and march us to class. Uh, we took uh, code and, and typing in a, inside of an old church. I don't remember what denomination, but we took electronics and scientific classes uh, in, in another part of the campus. And to get to this place where we took these classes, we had to march past the old boarded up stadium. And uh, we could see the massive old wooden doors uh, uh, to, the, to the stadium. And it was all closed up. And we marched past those doors every day, not knowing that fusion was being done, performed inside that old stadium at the University of Chicago. Uh, Ferrari was there, uh, and uh, they were putting these uh, rods in to control uh, the speed of the fusion and all, and all of these atomic particles was, it was all going on inside that stadium, and of course we were had no idea when we marched by it that all this was going on because it was all very top secret. When the, when the, we found out the news that uh, Japan had surrendered why we were in the harbor of a group of islands called Kermaretta, about 20 miles off the coast of Okinawa, and there were just hundreds of ships in this harbor. And uh, in the excitement why uh, many of the ships fired their guns up into the air and uh, uh, and they tried to bring it to a halt, which they eventually did, 
But uh, during the time that they were firing all these guns, why, one of the shells landed, came down and landed on our deck and our radio radar man uh, got a foot full of shrapnel and, uh, and he had to leave the ship. And so I had to do double duty for a while, both uh, standing radar, radio watch and radar watch. The uh, uh, radar was much simpler back then because it had only, it only been invented for a little while. And uh, uh, it was a cathode ray tube and uh, with the rotating disc on top of the ship uh, scanning, uh, why it just left a, a green line that would go around the scope and whenever the ra radar signals would pick up anything and reflect back, it would leave a blurb or an image on the scope. And uh, uh, when I stood the duty, why I was to watch the scope all the time and if it, it picked up anything to inform the bridge. And uh, even if you didn't pick up anything, why you were supposed to call up to the bridge ever three, four, five minutes uh, just to let them know that all was clear. Well, when the war ended, I was still at uh, Okinawa doing radar picket duty. And uh, then it was then that I left the ship because of appendicitis attack. And uh, then instead of getting back to my ship, they put me on a, a captain's staff as his radio man to go up to the Inland Sea of Japan and destroy these mines. When that job was over with, I had enough points to muster out to go home. And uh, so uh, instead of flying back to the States, uh, I was put on the crew of this ship that carried had been torpedoed, just boarded up a plate over the hole, and it carried 18 foot of water in number two hold. So the top speed that that ship could go was five knots. So we came uh, back to Seattle, Washington, uh, all the way across the Pacific Ocean at five knots. It took us 45 days to come back. <laughs> Got off ship and right away, uh, instead of taking the train back, why five of us uh, paid money to a fellow that was driving a car coming back to uh, Omaha, I think it was, picking up house trailers and hauling them back to the coast. And coming back to get the trailer, he, he wasn't pulling anything. And so I don't know how, how my fellow uh, sailors found out about it, but anyway, we each chipped in some money to him. And, and, uh, and so when we came back, why, uh, we got us I, I was li my parents were living at Larnard then, and uh, when we got to Phillipsburg, which is right over here, uh, they kicked me out of the car and said, from there down to Larnard, you have to find, find your own way. And this was at 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning. Went into Martha's Cafe, and there were people in the cafe, and, and so we just announced loudly that Anybody going south, why, if they could take a sailor, for, uh, he was heading for Larnard, and, and uh, one fellow said, well, I'm going to Great Bend, which is only 23 miles from Larnard. I said, great, I have an uncle living in Great Bend, and he dropped me off at my uncle's house at 5 a.m. in the morning, and I woke him up, and, and he took me on then back to Larnard to my home. <laughs> And so when I got back to this, uh, I got a 30-day leave, and I came home, met my wife, and told her I was going to get married uh, as soon as I got mustered out. And uh, she was starting to worry because I had to go back to Chicago then to get mustered out, and uh, it took a little longer than planned, and I made it. I made it back just three days before our wedding. <laughs> we were just stuck on Navy Pier, uh, waiting to 
to get our orders to muster out. And then they didn't muster us out there. They sent us to St. Louis to actually get uh, discharged. I met Doris uh, on my 30-day leave uh, coming back from the overseas. Uh, in Larnard, five of my five of us high school buddies were uh, going to go to Manhattan to K State and then pre-enroll. And I knew, well, I'm going to Emporia State where my father went. But uh, I'll just go along for the ride and for the fun of it. And so we got in pre, they got a pre-enrolled in, in uh, K-State uh, early enough in the day. One said, uh, I've got a stepsister living at the YWCA in Wichita. Let's call her, have her get us dates, and we'll go dancing at the Blue Moon in, in Wichita. And so she, uh, he, she found some girls, which Doris was one. <coughs> Three of us wanted when when we met the girls, we we hadn't decided who was going to go with who. Three of us all wanted Doris, so how we said, well, how are we going to decide who gets who? And one of them said, let's flip. An odd man gets to take Doris. I was odd man, so I got to take Doris. First date, I fell madly in love. I told her that uh, I was going to marry her. She said, well, I'm not even supposed to be with you. She said, I'm already spoken for. I said, well, I got to change that. <laughs> she didn't know anything about it God until afterwards. never changed. God <laughs> never changed. <laughs> Went to Chicago and got mustered out, came back, got married, had a two-week honeymoon in Estes Park and went to college at Lindsburg, Kansas. My first of this month will have been married 68 years. My bachelor's degree at Bethany College, Lindsburg, and my master's degree in music education at the University of Colorado out of Boulder. I, I went through Bethany in three and a half years because I went to summer schools too. So my fourth year, I got out in January before the Messiah performed that fourth year. The first year I was there, I sang in the chorus the next two years, they found out I played oboe, so I played oboe in the orchestra for the Messiah. I hope, I hope the countries can find solutions to somewhat world peace, so that we know. Because I think the next, if there is a next war, it'll be horrible. Well, I went in at still seventeen. I I turned eighteen in boot camp, and. Uh, and uh, I came out at age 20. I've, all, I've often said I wouldn't trade the experience for anything in the world, but I wouldn't want to do it again. <laughs>